Good morning and welcome to the field's COVID-19 seminar. I will now hand you over to Jan Hong Wu, who will introduce, or uh, Kumar Murti, I'm not sure, who will introduce our speaker this morning. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe I will do it and Jan Hong will do the, um, the Q&A at the end. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the seminar and uh, this week's uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Syed Mughadaz from York University, and he will speak on understanding COVID-19 and its public health challenges. Syed, please. Uh, okay, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Phil's Institute and organizers for inviting me to give a talk on COVID-19. Uh, um, I thought, uh, given the condition right now, um, it would be good to uh, present some of the work that we have done well, in collaboration with others, um, colleagues in Canada and the United States, um, to highlight uh, some of the public health challenges of COVID-19 and how modeling uh, has helped uh, address some of these challenges and um, present some of the key characteristics of this uh, emerging disease. Um, and finally, uh, you know, look at what uh, we would expect in the next uh, uh, few months uh, or few years in terms of um, potential outcomes of COVID-19 and how modeling can help uh, address some of those challenges. So, I'd like to start with uh, acknowledging the group that uh, has been very active on modeling um, side of uh, COVID-19, uh, especially trying to inform public health uh, decision-making in, in Canada and the United States. Um, there are a number of institutes that have been involved in the projects that we've been uh, conducting, uh, including my lab, uh, Center for Infectious Disease Modeling Analysis at Yale University, uh, National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases in University of Manitoba, um, Canadian Center for Vaccinology in Dalhousie, Center for Vaccine Development in University of Maryland, Emerging Pathogens Institute in University of Florida, and University of uh, Texas Integrative Biology Institute. So there are a large number of individuals um, uh, have contributed to, to this work. I probably missed some names, I apologize for that. Uh, but very early, the team put actually three major proposals together for Canadian Institute of, for Health Research, National Institute of Health, and National Science Foundation. Um, and those projects um, were funded uh, the team started to actually uh, integrate modeling with data and look at what we expect from this emerging disease. So I'm going to go through some of the activities and modeling um, uh, uh, studies that we have done um, and trying to highlight some of the key outputs of these modelings. From very early the stage of the disease, we needed to know uh, how fast this disease will spread. And one of the uh, activities that we had very really early was understanding uh, a key characteristics of COVID-19, which is, uh, I, I'm assuming that everybody is familiar with this concept of uh, reproduction number. Um, we looked at this reproduction number from the perspective of initial cluster of uh, COVID-19 patients in Wuhan. Uh, we looked at uh, the date of symptom onset, where, which um, majority of them were in December 2019. Uh, and we used very sophisticated uh, a statistical method to actually estimate the reproduction number among those patients. Uh, so uh, it became kind of clear that when we look at the cluster of patients, the reproduction number is relatively high. It was the mean around, um, yeah, the mean of the reproduction number was around four. Uh, but when you look at the community spread of the disease, the reproduction number rarely gets to that high level is uh, largely between two and three 
or around uh, the highest was uh, 3.5. Uh, given that this reproduction number was uh, significantly higher than what we observed for uh, most seasonal epidemics and uh, potentially pandemic influenza, um, we had the sense that this emerging disease will be uh, spreading rapidly and potentially is not uh, containable at the source. Um, so the next question for us was, if the disease is spreading, uh, what is the risk of uh, a global pandemic for this uh, emerging disease? Sorry. Uh, so we looked at, um, uh, all the travels out of China uh, to a lot of different cities uh, around the world in different countries, uh, look at uh, time of arrival, time of departure, time of arrival, and we look at the generation time, which was really a key factor in deciding or determining uh, what the risk of um, uh, disease importation is into different countries around the world. So the longer the distance uh, from uh, departure to arrival, um, the most likely that you, you would capture the person if they were infected before they, uh, they actually um, uh, depart from their own country. Uh, and uh, this, is, this was one of the key uh, studies we did early on before uh, WHO actually announced pandemic we determined that the, there is a very high risk of global pandemic spreading across the world, um, especially when we focus on, on the uh, number of large cities in the United States, including LA, Washington, and New York. It became clear that um, there's a high risk of uh, pandemic uh, that we, we will deal with. So understanding that there is a risk of pandemic and um, it, it, it didn't take that long for WHO to actually announce this is a pandemic, then for us, the next question was, um, uh, you know, given that containment at the source was not achievable, uh, what is the next uh, best strategy to deal with this pandemic? Um, and our studies mainly focus in the United States and Canada, uh, given the collaboration was going on and given a lot of, um, you know, uh, computational and modeling infrastructure that we built over the years uh, within our uh, team of collaborations. Um, so th there are two important aspects of, um, disease control when containment is not achievable. And the first one is really mitigation. So we use all the uh, resources and measures available, you know, at, um, um, at our public health system uh, to mitigate the impact of the disease in terms of infection, hospitalization, and mortality. Uh, which would also lead to a reduction of uh, other aspects of disease, including, um, you know, uh, socioeconomic uh, repercussions. But also we looked at um, other questions in terms of how we optimize uh, resource allocation and utilization. And the key uh, question for us was really uh, uh, the allocation of hospital bed uh, hospital beds in, in the United States and Canada, whether we have enough resources, uh, given that we're not dealing with just COVID, there are a number of other um, um, healthcare needs that we need to address during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, so we, the modeling uh, project that we conducted uh, looked at um, potential need for hospital bed utilization uh, and whether 
isolation of cases with the uh, symptoms of COVID would actually accommodate this situation so that we uh, we don't end up having shortage of bed or ventilators for uh, critical care of uh, COVID patients. Uh, it turns out that based on our studies that, um, you know, self-isolation and identification of only symptomatic cases, whether it's mild or severe, is not sufficient to actually maintain the surge capacity required for um, uh, hospitalization of COVID patients. And that was uh, one of the key conclusion of this study is published in, in proceeding of the National Academy of Science. Um, and we conducted a, um, a follow-up study on um, whether ventilators, the need for ventilators would be enough uh, for critical uh, care of um, COVID-19 patients. That's also published in uh, uh, Lancet. And uh, the outcomes were, were indicating that we need more than just uh, isolation of um, uh, symptomatic cases of uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, so that was on the state side. Uh, in the Canadian side, we also did a modeling study, which is um, which was agent-based modeling essentially, um, looking at the excess demand for critical care. Uh, we collected uh, data on um, critical care capacity in Canada for different provinces. And we developed a model, and this model is still based on initial understanding of the disease uh, before a lot of different characteristics of the disease were determined based on the data that came out fol following this study. So we needed to consider uh, existing hospital capacity, and we looked at the risk factors associated with severe COVID-19 and hospitalization which um, affected a lot of uh, individuals in older population. Um, so the, the model we developed was fairly simple, um, uh, very similar to type of influenza modeling uh, studies that you have seen over years. We looked at uh, individuals in susceptible, exposed, um, and infected, infectious with severe or mild, and self-isolation of individuals. And for those who are severe, uh, we looked at the possibility of hospitalization um, with um, ICU admission, uh, potential death and recovery and discharge from hospitalization. So it became also very clear that self-isolation of individuals is not a sufficient uh, method of containing the disease or reducing the impact of the disease, uh, given capacity of uh, hospitalization we have in Canada. So essentially these studies uh, were telling us that we need a little bit more, at least um, uh, in mitigation part to, to reduce the strain that we might see on hospital capacity in US and Canada. So the next question for us uh, was how bad the disease is really in terms of uh, mortality. Um, so obviously based on all the research studies that have been done in, in, um, uh, in different countries, um, you would see that uh, virulent of the disease uh, differs in different contexts, different population settings, um, but there is a consensus that COVID is uh, significantly more virulent than uh, influenza. Uh, of course, this is really the case, but it may not be completely a fair comparison with influenza because for influenza, we have uh, significant pre-existing immunity in the population through cross-reactivity 
um, as well as vaccine that we have every year before uh, actual epidemic. So consideration of pre-existing immunity in vaccine is a big factor that reduces mortality of influenza, which we didn't have those factors for COVID-19. So obviously, uh, lethality of this disease is, is relatively high. But we looked at uh, data from Canada and US, um, um, infections and um, reported deaths, and we used a met statistical methodology to, to consider for right censoring of the time since infection until reported death uh, to estimate uh, the case fatality rate in Canada and the United States. Um, I mean, without adjusting for case fatality rate, obviously the crude uh, fatality rate is relatively high, but considering adjustment, um, the case fatality rate was somewhere between 1.5 and 2. This is early stage of the disease. Um, and this uh, depended on um, what percentage of uh, cases were reported in Canada and US. If you look at the uh, bottom of uh, my screen, the right side, you would see that in the United States, at the very early stage of the disease, there were uh, the rate of reporting for actual cases were relatively low between 10 and 20%. Uh, in Canada was somewhere between 15 and 55 percent, and those are relatively low reporting rates, uh, indicates that, you know, about 50 percent of cases were not even reported. And this is only symptomatic cases of uh, COVID-19. Uh, later on, we realized that um, a large portion of the population could also be uh, asymptomatic, which is not really diagnosed. So the conclusion of this study is that yes, uh, COVID is um, uh, is more lethal than seasonal influenza. There's a relatively high case fatality rate in different population settings, but at the same time, this is in the context of not having any pre-existing immunity to this emerging disease and lack of any significant preventive measures such as vaccine. Um, over time, as we were doing these studies, um, uh, a number of key uh, research outputs um, uh, highlighted important characteristics of the disease, and especially uh, the presence of pre-symptomatic and significant transmission of disease pre-symptomatic, essentially before symptom onset. Uh, this actually was critical for us in terms of revising our modeling structure uh, to make a more accurate natural history of the disease, which includes uh, you know, exposure to the disease. Um, um, and there's incubation period for the disease before uh, a person becomes um, symptomatic. Um, and then going through other stages of the disease that were either mild symptomatic or critical um, condition of the uh, COVID patients. Uh, so uh, there are some studies going on and um, we looked at existing literature in terms of what percentage of individuals would be considered asymptomatic um, or are essentially not showing any symptoms during the entire uh, course of disease. And it seems that children uh, having the highest percentage of asymptomatic uh, proportion among uh, all uh, infections, uh, elderly over 60 years of age, they had the lowest percentage of asymptomatic cases. Uh, so this is actually critical because early on, uh, we, we wouldn't observe a significant, um, uh, you know, impact of disease on children and uh, having a large portion of asymptomatic may actually explain that, uh, that observation. One of the critical 
uh, uh, characteristic of the disease is the transmission uh, before onset of the symptoms. Uh, and that has significant implication for the control of the disease uh, in terms of implementation of different mitigation measures and, um, and uh, how likely is to be able to contain the disease uh, without a vaccine uh, in place. Uh, you can see in the bottom of uh, my screen to the right side that uh, I have a diagram from one of the, from actually two studies looking at average infectiousness of the disease and there is a significant infectivity of individuals before onset of symptoms and that indicates that uh, there is a significant potential transmission happening uh, before onset of symptoms. And this was also consistent with early observation that there is a, a negative serial interval, meaning that infection can be transmitted before symptom onset. So with this understanding of uh, disease dynamics, uh, now was the time essentially for us to look at uh, the impact of different intervention uh, strategies that were implemented, um, uh, some of them at the global uh, scale, and some of them were specific to different uh, geographic regions or, or countries. Um, one of the measures that were, uh, uh, that was actually most consistently applied worldwide was a school closure. So most of the evidence that we get for the effect of school closure and reducing uh, disease spread among children and in the wider community is from uh, essentially from influenza epidemics um, and uh, some of it coming from the last uh, pandemic of 2009. Uh, but the question was whether uh, school closure is an effective uh, control measure uh, during COVID-19. So we actually conducted a study, and this is a still agent-based modeling based on a, our understanding of uh, uh, natural history of the disease and uh, potential for transmission of the disease uh, before symptom onset. And uh, we, our findings indicated that school closure has relatively low impact uh, without implementation of other interventions, for example, isolation of cases um, and use of other social distancing measures. And there's a, um, uh, there are some important reasons behind this uh, conclusion that the school closure is not as effective uh, as it is during uh, influenza seasons or influenza epidemics. And those are essentially related to the characteristics of the, this emerging disease. Uh, and I'm highlighting some of those uh, differences here that uh, uh, we observed that COVID-19 is significantly more transmissible than influenza epidemics. It has a larger reproduction number um, it has significantly long, longer incubation period. Incubation period for influenza is generally between 1.5 to 2 days. For COVID is, um, is between 5 to 8 days. And uh, the key factor that I highlighted uh, 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 previously is that um, COVID is highly infectious during pre-symptomatic stage. Uh, influenza has a pre-symptomatic stage, but is less infectious compared to its symptomatic stage. And these are really key characteristics of COVID that um, are important in understanding the effect of different interventions and highlighted that uh, school closure is not as effective as uh, we, we may expect. Um, 
how feasible is to control COVID-19 given all the interventions that we had in place? Uh, so school closure obviously was one of the first interventions that were implemented in, in Canada, in US and uh, many other countries around the world. Uh, but um, there were also uh, case isolation, identification of symptomatic cases very early on and um, isolate them. Um, that was another intervention before we started to actually look at lockdown. And um, the study that we conducted, uh, published in Proceeding National Academy of Science, uh, indicated that case isolation is also not sufficient uh, to uh, control the disease. Even all the cases are immediately isolated and their transmission, uh, onward transmission prevented. Uh, and this is largely going back to the uh, uh, important uh, characteristics of the COVID-19 that transmission was still possible uh, before symptom onset. Uh, when we look at um, analysis that we conducted here, it became clear that uh, given uh, asymptomatic uh, transmission, um, we would need minimum 30 to 30% 30 of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic cases to be identified before they can transmit the disease in order to be able to control the disease. And that's essentially a significant portion of silent infection. Uh, that means that we need to consider other mitigation measures, including contact tracing of um, uh, identified cases, and uh, looking at quarantine of individuals in order to prevent onward transmission from any potential infected cases. So given these conclusions that we had so far from these studies uh, conducted uh, and other modeling groups, um, there were questions coming up that uh, what would be the outcome after lockdown? In lockdown, we had a number of these strategies in place. Uh, essentially, there is no school, um, stay, stay home orders, and um, working from home, all these measure, social distancing measures that helped control um, the first wave of COVID-19 in US and large part of um, uh, a large part of US and in Canada. Now the question is, what do we do post lockdown, uh, given that there is still no vaccine uh, in place and there is a potential for resurgence of the disease and causing uh, large outbreaks, given that the population is largely susceptible. So we looked at, uh, again, potential for uh, shelter in place or a stay at home uh, for different age groups um, and in order to avoid a widespread stay at home orders, which uh, cause a significant dent to, uh, in terms of socioeconomic aspects of the populations. So when we look at different uh, age groups and uh, considering shelter in place for these uh, different age groups, uh, we found that um, if we look at- It's 11 uh, o'clock. Excuse me. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, age group of 50 to 64, and we look at a stay at home orders for these individual, that's the most effective strategy in terms of reducing attack rate, hospitalization, and death. Uh, and on the right side of my screen, you can see that, uh, you know, the return of uh, per capita uh, sheltering place of individuals in that age group that I highlighted, which is S3, um, um, would have significant impact in reducing attack rate, hospitalization, and death compared to other strategies uh, 
that had different age groups uh, considered for a stay at home uh, in the population. So one thing that I wanna highlight here, which is very interesting, is that if you look at uh, S1 strategy, which is essentially chill, uh, school children, uh, age group between five and 19, they have the same um, percent, they constitute the same uh, uh, proportion of the population, which is around 19% uh, as uh, S3, which is the population of 50 to 64 um, years of age group, again, around uh, 19%, but the outcome of these um, uh, a stay at home a strategy for these two different age groups are vastly different. So we see that S3 is significantly more effective than looking at, for example, a school closure. Uh, there are some other age groups that have similar proportion uh, compared to S3, um, and, but their impact on reducing uh, attack rate, hospitalization, or debt is significantly lower. Obviously, if you look at lockdown, the strategy is essentially considering all these individuals in any age category as staying at home, and that would have the largest impact uh, as we observed in, in uh, controlling initial outbreaks. But this is considering that post lockdown, we would, um, uh, we would potentially not order any, uh, any shelter in place and uh, stay at home. So uh, I'm sorry, Say, um, could I ask a question? Reviews sure, my sure. access. So in, in the case of second outbreak, so what I'm saying is this really depends on when you are excised then place the people uh, at home. Uh, so it depends on the timing in relation to whether it's the initial outbreak or in, in the expansion growth phase or during the peak time, in the right? Yes, yes. Uh, this is actually considering that you have some level of uh, pre-existing uh, pre level of immunity given initial outbreak. So another question for us following this, um, you know, consideration of shelter in place post lockdown was the use of masks. And this is also obviously uh, a significant uh, contagious uh, debate in US and many other settings uh, in terms of whether masks are effective and whether it should be mandated or not. And um, it's actually a very important concept in understanding the effect of mass that it's not uh, only useful when individuals are infectious or when susceptible individuals uh, make contact infectious individuals. It's also very useful uh, when susceptible individuals are in uh, public uh, domain and there is a potential for airborne transmission of the disease. So there are different aspects into the use of masks and it can potentially flatten the curve uh, of epidemic significantly depending on the compliance of the uh, population uh, uh, for, mask, uh, for wearing masks. Uh, we looked at um, how effective masks are um, depending on the compliance of the population. Uh, obviously masks only is not going to be able to um, contain the outbreak, but it's going to have a significant effect on flattening the curve of the outbreak, depending on the compliance, as I said. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the significance of masks is actually more on the, on to the outcomes of the uh, COVID-19, which is death and hospitalization, um, but less on the infection uh, spread in the population. So obviously looking at uh, lockdown strategies, uh, there are a number of interventions uh, considered, including a stay at home orders, uh, wearing masks, uh, social distancing, um, 
uh, a number of uh, combination of a number of strategies. Uh, but there is another question uh, that uh, is important to look at it post lockdown is the possibility of uh, institutional outbreaks uh, that may be triggered by uh, introduction of um, an asymptomatic case uh, into the environment. So obviously uh, we had a large number of um, uh, nursing homes and healthcare facilities in Canada and US that were affected by COVID-19 uh, with a significant uh, number of deaths. And this is an important concept of going, um, going forward uh, in, in terms of preventing institutional outbreaks and minimizing the death among uh, most vulnerable populations. Uh, so one of the strategies that are being implemented in hospitals and many other uh, settings is uh, frequent testing of individuals in order to identify if they are infected and um, screening them from um, coming to work and potentially triggering an outbreak. Uh, so one study that we conducted is that we, the question was how frequent um, um, a nasopharyngeal um, test uh, should be done in order to identify sufficient um, percentage of silent infection that could prevent uh, any, any outbreak. And what we looked at the infectivity profile of individual. The next, uh, the next question after um, shelter in place uh, for us was the uh, testing of individuals in order to prevent any uh, institutional outbreak. And, and we looked at uh, two different tests, uh, NPT test, nasopharyngeal test, and as a gold standard and saliva test which has a lower sensitivity, but compared to NPT uh, is um, significantly less uh, invasive. Uh, obviously, testing is really critical in terms of uh, preventing uh, transmission of silent infection into any environment and triggering an outbreak. And what we found was that um, testing, uh, three-day frequency of testing, saliva testing, uh, would help identify around 73% of uh, all cases at any stage of the disease and 36% of cases um, during pre-symptomatic uh, uh, stage of the disease. And that, that would um, satisfy the condition for prevention of uh, an outbreak uh, with identification of sufficient uh, silent infection. So this was another study that we did in terms of uh, 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 mitigation measures uh, being implemented post lockdown. Uh, but I guess combining all these measures, um, a key uh, conclusion is that we still need something more significant to prevent the transmission of the disease in the first place. And that's really the, uh, the, uh, that's really highlighting the importance of vaccine development. Uh, so right now, given all the uh, devastating outcomes of uh, COVID-19 globally, uh, the population is largely susceptible. Uh, so we need to uh, have an effective and safe vaccine in order to prevent infection and minimize potential outcomes. Uh, currently, we have over 230 vaccine candidates in development in different countries uh, with seven different vaccine technology. Um, and modeling has a, a very important role to play here in terms of understanding what the effect of a vaccine would be uh, and what are the optimal strategies for vaccination, given that um, 
a large number of uh, variables are in play, uh, including vaccine efficacy, time of vaccine availability, and uh, public health distribution capacity. Um, well, we probably see some uh, shortage of vaccine supply uh, at the onset of any campaign, uh, and this would um, indicate uh, that we would need to prioritize individuals in terms of uh, severity of their disease and potential risk of uh, individuals, including healthcare workers and individuals with comorbidities. So that's really important uh, aspects of the work that I think a large number of uh, studies are being conducted at this point by different groups, understanding the effect of vaccine um, in, um, uh, in next few months and potentially follow up for um, other vaccine platforms uh, that could provide uh, significant data on efficacy and safety. Um, I'm hoping you still have my voice, right? We can hear you. Uh, so I think I'm essentially done with my presentation. I wanted to actually end with uh, uh, this last slide that what we might expect from COVID-19 in coming months and, and years. And this is something that uh, different modeling groups uh, could actually uh, study and come up with uh, solution and information that could help public health uh, decide on the optimal uh, intervention strategy. And one of them is actually potential for mutation of the virus. We already have some reports on reinfection of individuals with different strains of uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, and this could have significant implications for vaccine effectiveness uh, and possibly uh, becoming a more, um, uh, more seasonal uh, disease uh, rather than an emerging disease uh, and uh, being uh, disappeared. Uh, so there are other uh, questions on the table in terms of the evolution of the virus, whether the virus uh, will be less or more lethal compared to the current stage of the disease. Uh, and the evolution and mutation of the virus could actually cause a change in uh, its outcomes uh, in terms of um, affecting different age groups in the population. Uh, obviously, so far, there is no uh, approved drugs for treatment of uh, COVID, uh, but there are a number of um, uh, research studies going on in terms of uh, developing an effective drug uh, in order to uh, reduce the illness and potentially prevent death caused by COVID-19. And again, all these factors um, could be in play for modeling. And I'm hoping that um, uh, different modeling groups uh, would have a significant uh, contribution to, uh, to addressing these questions uh, and potentially many more questions that will come up uh, possibly during vaccination and post-vaccination uh, era of COVID-19. So with that, I'll, I'll end my presentation and I'll be happy to uh, answer any question you might have. Um, and again, I apologize for uh, interruption in the, during the talk. Okay. Thank you, Saeed. And uh, uh, it's very, uh, comprehensive study and uh, uh, I, I know you're very busy and uh, not because of your uh, involvement with different panels of the agencies, uh, both Canada and US, but also uh, your role in the directorate of a graduate program. So I really appreciate your coming to give this presentation. So um, I think we are have time for questions and uh, you, if you like, you can raise the questions or you can send a, a message to Charles that uh, uh, we can 
unmute you. So, Jonan, could I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, so, firstly, Syed, this, this is extremely uh, uh, interesting presentation, and uh, I don't think I've digested everything that you said. I want to see it again, but 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 let me ask you a, a kind of really practical question in terms of what everybody's eyes are on right now, that we're just about starting the second wave in Ontario. Um, John Hong has done all the calculations and we know the case case numbers are, are uh, poised to make a significant increase. Um, in terms of all the analysis you've done and on the effects you've seen of different mitigation strategies, um, if you were to give advice now on um, one or two things uh, policy decisions that should be made, what would your focus be on? Would it be on school closures again? Would it be uh, rather on um, um, restricting movements of the elderly? What, what, would, what do you think is, uh, would be the most effective interventions right now as we face the, uh, a serious second wave? I think there are a number of mitigations that have uh, collective impact. I would say. So obviously, as I mentioned, a school closure has relatively low impact mm -hmm. uh, for COVID-19 compared to influenza, but it doesn't mean that we should not look at a school closure. A school closure in the context of other interventions could still be a useful intervention. Um, uh, potentially, we're looking at, you know, social distancing, mask wearing is mandated in in many different uh, contexts uh, in, in Ontario now in public places, mask is mandated. That's a very important measure. I, I think there is a combination of measures are, um, that could help uh, mitigate the impact of the disease and the rise in the infection. Um, this is something that we expected that we going to our seasonal influenza, we would probably get uh, an increase in the number of cases and we have to be prepared. But I think uh, the key measure here that could uh, help a lot is um, vaccination. If vaccine becomes available uh, relatively early and um, can be distributed widely, uh, you know, an important aspect of this um, uh, vaccine vaccination campaign is to have the capacity to distribute vaccination, mm -hmm. uh, especially to those who are most vulnerable to the disease. And this is something that uh, Canada should work on it to expand the capacity for vaccine distribution. Uh, one of the studies that I didn't, uh, you know, uh, present here highlighted any kind of results out of that, which is still under review, is we observed that vaccination could have a large impact, even with a relatively low vaccine efficacy of 30%. Mm -hmm. uh, so early vaccination is more important than higher uh, efficacy vaccine mm -hmm. uh, when vaccine va vaccination campaign is uh, implemented late. So I would say, again, a large number of factors are in, in, in play, uh, but this is also a responsibility of individuals to not only protect themselves, but also protect others by you know, uh, adhering to these uh, control measures recommended by Public Health uh, Agency of Canada and public health departments. Sure, thank you. Said, I don't hear questions, so I, I would like to continue this question on the vaccine with no efficacy. So if it's one dose, if you think about uh, vaccine efficacy uh, uh, with no efficacy, so uh, what would happen if people take the vaccine, they perceive the protection even though the efficacy is so no, so they are they will be increasing the activity, they probably will not wear the mask, and they probably will not go for quarantine if they are identified being having close contact. Am I right? So, uh, so, right. so this vaccine is going to have 
negative impact on the public health measures. And if you want people to take what I think cannot heal, then actually it's not going to be that effective. It's still go as usual. So uh, I just don't know how to communicate this message. Uh, yeah, this is actually one of the uh, important um, aspects of the work that we studied during uh, vaccine modeling. Uh, that you know, being vaccinated and perceived as protected uh, may actually encourage individuals to have the normal social activity, uh, interact with others, um, and potentially risk uh, not only uh, infection of themselves but others because vaccine is not 100% uh, effective. Um, depending on the efficacy of vaccine, individuals may still get infection. And there is a potential for individuals being infected and not showing any symptoms when they have vaccine-induced immunity. So vaccine-induced immunity may interfere with presentation of symptoms. Um, and therefore, individuals may be uh, contributing to spread of infection uh, in the form of asymptomatic uh, disease. And that's also another key uh, uh, aspects of vaccination that has to be considered in, in public health messaging that, you know, vaccination doesn't mean that we, we, we can um, ignore all other measures. Based on the study we did, vaccination helps mitigate the disease, but uh, still other measures are needed. Uh, to contain the disease and reduce the impact of the, uh, the outcomes in terms of hospitalization and uh, mortality. So I think is, as you said, is, is very critical for public health to have uh, this, um, the effect of vaccine uh, and importance of vaccination uh, communicated effectively with, with the public in terms of uh, what are the risks uh, after vaccination, uh, and what is the importance of vaccination in preventing the disease uh, while adhering to other interventions to reduce the, uh, the potential transmission post-vaccination. Thank you. Uh, Said, um, any yes. other questions or comments? There, there are questions in the chat, it seems, Jan Hong. Um, it's not for me. Oh, I have a Mark, Mark Penny. Mark, can you uh, raise a question directly or you want me to do it for you? So there is a question from Mark. Ah, sorry, I was still muted. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you had an explanation for um, why uh, people in the 15 to 64 age bracket, isolating them had the most uh, efficacy of any other population? Uh, so this is actually a very good question. And what we explored in the analysis was that um, these individuals have a significantly different contact structure with other age groups uh, in the population. Um, a, a large portion of these individuals are uh, working class. Uh, so they have contacts with, um, with other age groups in the population during daily activities. Uh, they also have a large uh, number of contacts with children. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, going to school teachers, uh, parents, uh, a significant portion of that population um, is within those age groups. Uh, as well as uh, comorbidities uh, and potential for severe outcomes of, of, uh, within this age group. So uh, 50 to 64 is a still um, an age group that is considered as uh, one of the age groups significantly affected by COVID-19. Uh, and um, a large portion of uh, this age group has one of those six comorbidities associated with COVID-19. So all, combining all these factors uh, uh, in the model indicated that, you know, sheltering or stay at home order for these individuals is the most effective in terms of reducing um, 
um, infection, hospitalization, and, and, and death. Uh, obviously, combining with any other age groups would increase the effect, but the effect, uh, the increase... Um, it's 11.30. Uh, the increase in the population's size uh, for sheltering um, is going to have diminishing return in terms of uh, reducing hospitalization and death. So that, that, uh, that age group had the largest impact um, per individual isolated or per individual shelter need. Yeah, thanks. That's sort of interesting because it also suggests they might be the ones which have uh, some of the largest social cost for isolating as well. Because yes, they probably that's... are providing a lot of labor, both uh, economically and in the household. Yes. Interesting. Thank you. So uh, I have a last I have question. Yeah, I have a question probably from maybe Sarah. You want to ask? Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, your presentation, it's very clear. Uh, I have a question about uh, mask. Uh, the mask reduce uh, the risk of uh, uh, spread of COVID-19, but uh, the mask ha has a negative impact on the, the health. Uh, and in your, in your work, in your study, uh, do you do you do you do you do you analyze the the, the negative Im impact to uh, use the mask? Uh, so, thanks for the question. Uh, so there are some studies on on potential um, on, as you call it negative impact on the health uh, from masks and. We actually didn't consider those uh, effects in our study. What we were interested mostly in that study is that if we look at, um, you know, what we call it homemade masks that have, um, you know, significantly lower effectiveness uh, compared to surgical uh, or N95 masks, then what would be the impact uh, in in terms of reducing uh, infection and outcomes in, in the population. And we conservatively look at, um, you know, very low efficacy mask. The efficacy of the mask that we looked at it was essentially the lower end of um, estimates in the literature, about 20% in preventing uh, disease transmission. Um, so obviously there could be um, um, health effects, uh, those are probably not widespread. It could be um, very uh, specific individuals, um, but the impact of masks in general could offset uh, a lot of uh, factors that may not be uh, beneficial in wearing masks. Um, and that was really the important part of the study that we were looking at in terms of reduction of outcomes and uh, um, essentially hospitalization and death. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. So I do have a question. Uh, might be okay. I thought I wasn't close, but anyway, Saeed, uh, um, James, you're on the line and I cannot uh, shut you off. So maybe you should ask a question, James, please. <laughs> maybe the, John Hong the last one then. Huh? Yeah, that would be the last one. James, white mouse. James Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to unmute. Um, just a quick question, Sia, that's a nice talk. I was just curious if you also made some assumptions about whether or not uh, wearing a mask uh, reduced the severity of an infection in the, if it didn't prevent the infection. Uh, no, actually, we didn't make uh, that assumption. We, the, you know, the use of mask was only in prevention of uh, transmission or spread of the disease. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Great. So uh, thank you very much again um, uh, on behalf of Phil Institute and uh, Kuma is here on behalf of Kuma uh, and our task force. I want to thank you again, Said, for coming to the talk and, uh, and congratulations for uh, uh, lots of uh, important work.
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, uh, this was great um, communicating with other researchers, and um, I hope to be able to uh, collaborate with some of the individuals um, working on these uh, modeling activities. Good. Thank. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.